Welcome to the Fiber Art Forum Luncheon and Keynote Address by Fiber Art International 2022, Juror Jessica Hemming. Hey. <laughs> Jessica is joining us today on Zoom from Spain. Uh, I'm Stacy Offit, the project director, and I'm going to do a brief introduction and then I'll turn it over to her. This exhibition is a community galvanizer in so many ways. And it's this community that has elevated Fiber Art International to the globally recognized benchmark that it is, bringing the best contemporary art from across the world to Pittsburgh. And ex Woo, yeah, give it up. <laughs> and accelerating innovations in the field of fiber while preserving traditions and the use of fiber techniques and materials. This Jurd exhibition began in 1966 and was first called Stitchery International. For many years, this was a biennial exhibition, but as production grew to include programs, events, partnerships, outreach projects, and multiple venues, the show moved to the triennial format we know and love. As the director of this exhibition, it has been an extreme privilege to work with so many passionate people who came together for the love of fiber, art, and this platform, all in love, deep heartfelt love. So today I wanna read you a love letter, a few love letters actually. These are snippets from past director's statements and are filled with the incredible emotion and joy that I think we are all feeling today. In 2013, Jay and Desha wrote, directing Fiber Art International has been like tumbling headlong into a love affair. <laughs> it's accurate, right? I mean, right? <laughs> Here's another. Textiles have always been at the heart of our domestic lives. These objects were passed down as heirlooms, treasured since ancient times. They have adorned kings embellished temples and embodied cultural identity. Risa Nagan, she's here, right, Risa? <laughs> so, yeah, 2001. And love, of course, real love, it challenges us and it makes us better, right? So listen to this one. <laughs> we are challenged to transcend the traditional concept of fiber and to open our minds to its expanding vocabulary. And that was from 1997, Patty and Risa again. <laughs> uh, in 2004, Michelle Brown, Laura Tabachman, and Jean Thomas directed as a team, and they said, we thought of this show as a big responsibility and challenge, and now we realize it was also a tremendous opportunity for growth. We have been rewarded in ways we never expected. They also wrote about the a love of artists Said, a profound thanks to all of the artists whose work sustains and nourishes us. With gratitude extending to artists whose work was not selected for this, but who continue to create beautiful work, important work. In 1999, Billy Barnes and, Millie Barnes and Sally Eunice, uh, the, they said um, about the jurors and the artists, we feel immensely indebted to the artists. We are grateful to our extraordinary jurors who brought not only experience, but also meticulous care and respect to their selection process. And last one, this exhibition in itself is a work of passionate collaboration. Passionate collaboration. That was from Desha in 2010. These are words of the heart this connecting love we all share, it's powerful <laughs> and it's magnetic. And that's why 545 artists from 30 countries were drawn to answer the call for entry for this show, submitting nearly 1,300 works of art, 45 pieces that were selected by jurors Chiochu and Gianni, uh, Nena Okor and Jessica Hemmings. And those works are from 13 countries and 17 U.S. states the most widespread geographical representation of works in Fiber Art International's history. <laughs> so
So a huge, huge heartfelt thanks to the Fiber Arts Guild of Pittsburgh who produces this show, the Fiber Arts Guild members and board of directors, the Fiber Art International Executive Steering Committee, and volunteers, the artists, jurors, and sponsors, and individual donors, our outreach partner, Pittsburgh Center for Arts and Media, host galleries, brew house association, and contemporary craft, and foundations including Pennsylvania Council on the Arts, the Heinz Endowments, the Pittsburgh Foundation, Opportunity Fund, and the Lenore G. Tawney Foundation. Thanks to the swag bag contributors, Cranick, uh, Knitting Fever, Accessories Unlimited, um, and Plymouth Yarn Company. And thanks to Art Morbida for their collaboration on artist interviews, show promotion, and donation of the swag bags and printed copies of their publication inside. And thank you all for putting your whole heart into this. Now, let me introduce Fiber Art Forum 2022 juror and keynote speaker, Jessica Hemmings. Welcome, everyone. Can somebody give me a signal that the sound is OK? Thank you. <laughs> um, I, should, I should start with um, a, a great thanks for this invitation, both for the huge task of, of working um, with the fellow jury members and now to try and put together some, some thoughts for the, for the keynote, which hopefully will continue um, some of the comments that you just heard, heard from Stacy. Um, I've decided this afternoon to talk to you about um, the way that textiles can function as a witness. Um, I've spent a long time worrying about if the textile can do enough. <laughs> But recently, I've become interested in the, the witnessing and the recording um, that the textile is capable of. You heard that this jury selection was uh, the broadest, I learn now, um, of, of any that you have had so far. And what I've selected to talk about this afternoon, or maybe um, early afternoon for you, um, uh, a group of examples that hopefully take that breadth even further. I've always been fascinated by the idea that the textile moves and travels quite easily, maybe compared, compared to other types of, types of practices. Um, and so I, I have drawn an even more eclectic selection, which I, I sincerely hope might at least be some new names for, for some of you. I know that that's a tough, a tough call for a, um, a, a textile audience, but this is, this is partially my motivation in framing things, is to continue to cast our nets as, as wide as possible. Um, particularly because the textile is something that cuts across and moves over so, so very much. Uh, like many people, I don't do such a good job of speaking and um, typing at the same time, so I'm just going to move over to my screen. Is that all right for everyone? I know it's not perfect, but can somebody give me a signal? Um, if you push the slideshow tab, yep. and then um, go to, and perhaps also the full screen, but you can play from the start, that would be a good place. Even though I don't have- Yeah, there you device. go, that's perfect. very good. 
Okay, thank you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Sorry for that. It seems like an, an update happened. Um, <laughs> I'm, my tech skills are already out of date. Uh, sorry, sorry for, for that glitch, guys. Um, I was saying that I have uh, tried to cast the net even wider than the wide net that this um, that this um, exhibition has cast, because I think that that's what, one of the things that's so wonderful about about textiles. They absolutely do sit across language and culture. And as I mentioned to you before, I was fiddling with the screen. Um, I've become increasingly interested in this idea of the the textile as as witness. Um, I have often also been asked if I have a a, a particular interest in textiles that are political at the expense of other types of textile practice. And I've I've had to think about this a lot and realize that I don't, but maybe I do often gravitate towards those types of things in part because of the content of the stories that they allow me to tell. So I've done something quite eclectic uh, this afternoon and I, um, I'm going to try and mix together examples, some, some things that are highly political. And I think in these times are very important to talk about. And at the same time, some other things that are, are aesthetic endeavors that really play with and uh, respond to some of the very special potentials that the that the textile has. Um, so I wanted to to start with with this artist, Pesita Abad. Um, she is not not living anymore, um, but during her lifetime, she was absolutely, utterly prolific. And this work has a sort of a particular importance to me uh, in, in recent years, because this was the last exhibition that I saw before the pandemic closed everything. I saw it in, in the UK and of course had no idea, as with all of us, that um, I wouldn't be so freely wandering to exhibitions as, as I did when I, when I stopped to, to see this. Um, one of the things that I very much respond to in her work is that she traveled an enormous amount and lived in a, in a huge number of countries and took up the practices and the materials and the techniques and the cultures of each of, of the places that she worked in. So they're an enormous uh, record keeper, but also witness to the, the great variety of, of her own, own life. Um, she was from the Philippines. She was born in, in, the, in the Philippines, although she did live in the US for quite some time as well. And so I start with, with this, I think something that, that all of us can relate to in one way or another, that, that sense of a rootedness and a beauty in a, in a place where um, we might call familiar, if, if home might be a, a complicated word, at least familiar. Um, the village where I came from. I really hope the quality of the, the image is okay, but just in, in case, the beautiful blossoms are buttons um, in this piece. She often often worked with uh, Trapunto, but also um, painting and, and a whole, whole mixture of, of media. And she was you know, very interested in America's multiculturalism as well as the, um, the cultures that she then actually moved and lived amongst. One of the things that I, um, I thought was very sensitive about this particular exhibition also is the way that it is displayed, at least for a, for a textile person. Um, so you, can, you could walk around many of the, the works and see the back was given as much emphasis as the front. Um, that's not necessarily a, a great source of excitement for every type of viewer, but I think for those of us who are who are really enamored with the textile and its and its physical self, then being able to see the work in the round, even if that wasn't necessarily as she intended, I thought suggested a, an interesting curatorial move as textiles are becoming more welcome in, in, for want of a better word, slightly more mainstream spaces. I do think that we're starting to now see a, uh, experience with curators um, and gallery spaces as well who are becoming a lot more sensitive to things that to be honest people who have worked with textiles have always been very sensitive to I, this isn't a, a new thing to to understand um, but is starting to also ap appear in, in slightly more mainstream spaces long overdue but nice nice to see 
these pieces are huge. So this this gallery itself, Spike Spike Island in in Bristol in England, is a vast exhibition space. Um, and I, I think that that's also a, a good lesson to, to be reminded of. We can sometimes, in associating the textile with the domestic and with often um, women's lives, also start to then compress it to a certain type of scale and expectation. So the, the incredible volume and buoyancy of these pieces, I think they're not shy. Um, and I, I think that that's a, a remarkable um, lesson for for those who follow in her in her footsteps that this is not a material that needs to be small or needs to to be to be quiet um, one of the things that i think deserves some recognition is that in the case of abad's work her career unfortunately arrived too early. Um, the exhibition that I saw at Spike Island was, was, uh, was curated by her nephew and he recognizes the fact that there, are, there would have been many more exhibition opportunities for her if she had lived in different decades. And I think this is something that we need to continue to be aware of. There is more circulation between what we might continue to call the global global south and Europe and North America, but there still isn't nearly nearly enough. Um, there is now a quite a recovery effort to make an artist like this more accessible, at least through a um, um, available photographic record. But I think we continue we need to continue to be mindful today of what types of gaps are we accidentally creating that somebody. Um, 40 years in the future, we'll look and say, yes, but maybe we still haven't opened, opened all, of the, all of the doors. Another example of um, the front and back nature of, of these works, and of course, a, a, a very um, astute and early reworking of something that I think is now you know, very hotly debated at the a moment when it comes to uh, both the Black Lives Matter and the Me, Me Too movement. She was not working in the vocabulary of those things, um, the way that we name them now in recent years, but our naming of them is new. Somebody like her practice was addressing them many, many years earlier. I don't think that we necessarily always give credit for the textile being prescient or the textile even actually being a type of future predictor of things. And I think that's something else that maybe it's time to, to claim, um, that rather than get locked into some of the old stereotypes, there is also textile work that was so early, so, so early in its time in what it was saying about debates that are now current, uh, but the textile has been saying them for some time. Um, this is Ringgold, Faith Ringgold, an artist who I am trusting the room is probably really familiar with. So I haven't um, worked in, in depth with, with Ringgold for this particular talk. She's had a lot of media um, to her credit recently and, and some great exhibitions. But by coincidence, this is actually Ringgold writing of Abad's work. Um, widely traveled, Abad creates her work from the point of view of an international woman of color. Those of us who have also traveled extensively know that creative women of color are working all over the world and are not merely minority figures within the narrow confines of the Western art world. Um, Ringgold herself, a fascinating example of turning to the textile when some of her um, efforts with publishing felt as though she wasn't able to articulate a, an, a life experience that was authentic to, to her. Um, but I think, again, the, the textile does continue to, unfortunately, um, in some circles, remain something of a minority material. But I think that that's another thing to take up in these questions now, that the content of a lot of this work um, shouldn't, shouldn't fall into those categories anymore. It's, it's far, um, far too influential and far too current, or um, in the case of Abad, early. 
So I, I explained that I wouldn't go into depth um, about, about Faith Ringgold and, and artists that I would confess to have a mild obsession with. Really, really fascinated. Um, some of you might know that I have a particular interest in the relationship between text and textiles and literature and, and textiles. Um, and so, of course, something like these story quilts, which very literally are text on textile, fascinate me. I just give you this, this one example. Um, I suppose following on this theme of the not mere minority um, figures, Who's Afraid of Aunt Jemima is Ringgold's reworking of, of the, um, the, the rather problematic identity, which has recently been, been changed in, in branding. But in this particular story quilt, um, Aunt Jemima is an entrepreneur, a very successful entrepreneur. And so she completely re rewrites the story of what that identity would be and what its, what its potential is. But I, I said at the beginning that I rather consciously took this opportunity, I hope, to also maybe introduce you to some practices that are less familiar, because I think that the textile's ability to communicate across such geographies and generations and languages and cultures is, is part of its beauty and its power for, for me. Um, and, and so I, I, I've selected this Zimbabwean artist. He passed away in um, 2020, sadly, as a, as a very young man. Um, but Anth Anthony Bermheer was working also on a large scale um, this is called Houses for All, a, a critique of, the, um, of Zimbabwe's uh, empty promises to be able to provide sufficient housing for, for the country. Um, it's also a pieced work and the figures, if we want to call them that, particularly that fall across the bottom of the work, are clothes pegs traditional um, wooden clothes pegs, not, not the ones with the spring, but just the ones with the, with the slot in the center. And he talked about the, the contemplation, but also the peace he found in trying to make each, each one of these individual. But it's a protest, it's a piece of protest art as well, about what in the world is going, going wrong in this country to have so many people with in, insufficient housing. There. Hopefully you can see now a little bit more of the of the detail. Um, so he was he was very interested in trying to to bring the multiple identities into into his his work. He also talked about a shift from painting to working with textile. About um, he said something along the lines of not messing up his couch. <laughs> so he was able to um, sit and work in peace in his home, invest enormous amounts of time in these large scale works that, that required a lot of, of detail, just as his career was, was beginning to, to take, take off. Um, Doily's Generation, another piece of the same, same um, era, um, also with the, the clothes peg people populating the la a large portion of the, of the piece. Um, but the doilies that he, he refers to is, is what he also um, explained was his mother and many Zimbabweans work um, producing uh, crocheted doilies that would have been sold in, in South Africa and in informal cottage, cottage industry. unquestionably um, political, political statements about um, a lack of economic stability and a lack of basic, um, um, basic requirements for living, such as basic housing that he was, he was using that work to, to express in a context that I would add is, um, is very difficult for, to have open, open freedom of speech. But I wanted to shift, not give you whiplash, but to shift 
um, to, to this type of work as well, an array um, with, again, quite large, large scale installation. You're look, it's called tassels and you're looking exactly at tassels, um, which are hanging from pieces of wire. So they have a little, um, a little bounce or a, a spring in them. Um, Anna Ray talks about the fact that every time this work is installed, it, it understandably is quite different. It is not going to fall identically, the color pattern or the, or the height. And this work, I, I was able to see this work in an exhibition um, of tapestries um, called the Cordis Prize, which is in Edinburgh in, in Scotland. I saw it a couple of years ago. And if we're thinking about uh, how the textiles move around the world, how we think about them, how we, how we support them and, and how, how we continue to, to nurture exhibitions and events around them. I thought it was fascinating that um, that particular event, which was about tapestry weaving, had included a work like this. Now, I know uh, not everybody will join me in this <laughs> celebration and that there are people who would say, well, eh, you've got to be kidding, that's not a tapestry, what are we talking about? But Anna Ray explained that the decision for the wire and the tassel on the end was her representation of what it feels like when you finally cut a warp off, off a loom and the tension um, springs away as, as, you, as you release. Um, and I'm, I, I find those types of responses to the textile to be fascinating. They are truly embedded in a knowledge of how um, particular textile structures and particular materials work. In this case, they're then carried quite far away from that into a, a, a very different type of representation. Um, but I would um, say that there's um, something quite refreshing and, and welcoming in that being, being part of a, of a otherwise pretty traditional tapestry conversation. I think it's also interesting to think about the dynamism of this work, that it can't ever be the same twice. Um, you can imagine the installation is a little bit of a labor of love. Um, and uh, as so many things are never the same twice, the idea that it comes out to the public and it has some type of continuity, but it is always changing as well, I, I think is, is, a, is a very poetic um, musing on what, what material witnesses. These next works are by an artist from Argentina, an artist and a poet. Um, they are, they, they happen to be large as well. You, you think I'm going to have an obsession with, with large things. They happen to be large as well. They happen also to sometimes have a little bit of text on them. You can see some, some stitched at the bottom and a little bit that is white on white in the center as, as well. Um, I had the really good luck to have a studio visit with this artist um, several years years ago now, um, and she she talked about starting to work with the sewing machine and realizing how important it was for her body to be in constant constant movement, and so the works got larger. She took the foot off the the sewing machine so she could move the cloth around far far more freely um, and she also talks about the content of the work as being something that is personal and private and has elements that she can explain or wants to explain and also elements that are um, private are, are for us to intuit or, or possibly even not entirely um, explainable to, to herself. So she works in an exceptionally in, in instinctive way. There are often in her earlier works in particular bones in the pieces um, at the mid bottom of this piece, you might be able to, to make out uh, the, the black outline of a, of a pelvis. Um, This is a more, more recent work. Um, she, she is a 
artist of many talents and talks about the struggle and the frustration of where her time should be. Should she paint? Should she write poetry? She, should she invest her time in these very, very time consuming things to stitch? Um, and her experience of, of lockdown led her to realize that maybe she was already doing all three of those things on, on the textile all, already. Um, and she referred to it as, as something of a, of a revelation to realize that maybe they weren't in conflict. Maybe they were sometimes happening, happening together. Um, for somebody like me, who is very much interested in um, not, not only textiles, but how we write about textiles, um, a, a piece that is about a language, a stitched piece called language by somebody who is both a poet and uh, a textile artist, of course, is, is something that, that I, I become very excited by. And, and particularly, of course, her boldness with the, with the white space and the emptiness at the, at the bottom of, of this, this piece. It's been selected for the cover of the new textile reader, which will be out next year. Um, it's fine. It's a nice cover. But I do think that from an artistic point of view, um, the, the blank space at the bottom and that quietness and then the hubbub of the, the stitch in the middle is, um, says something as well about her poetry with how, how she works through her, through her threads. Um, so Florencia's work with, with bones, she also refers to um, Argentina's dirty war and the mass graves that are still, still being um, DNA matched and uncovered today and that as an Argentinian artist that's not something that she is able to escape even if she doesn't overtly want that to be the the sole purpose of her of her textile practice to make political statements. Um, this is this is maybe another example from a from the other side other corner of the world both um, uh, both far far to to the north um, north and, and west. Um, this is a Sami artist, Britta Labour, who works with issues often around global warming. Um, particularly, we all are aware of these changes, but populations that are living in the far north and have seen such a shift in their climate, their, um, their volume of snow, the amount of um, weather that they expect in, in a certain, certain season. She makes these very poetic works that are about Sami, um, Sami traditions and what will happen with this changing landscape that they are meeting maybe before other parts of, of the world. And these, um, uh, canonic, these cones shapes that she has in the background, they're also being worn on the people on, in the sled, sleds. This is um, a, another little bit of a political statement about dress traditions which were banned, um, sort of out, outlawed, um, her, that her people were not, not allowed to use or it was sort of cons considered um, heathen practices and not, not to be continued. And there's been a huge movement recently um, to, to return to a lot of the craft traditions of this part of the world and actually for many other people to turn and start learning from them and recognize that um, that connection to local materials and to local types of, of knowledge and a very sensitive way of existing on the landscape is a lesson that every corner of the world needs, needs to heed. Some groups of people have become further from it than, than others. The Sami live across um, the, the Arctic Circle of um, Norway, Finland, um, and, and into, into some, of, some of Russia as, as well, and Sweden. Um, this is an Icelandic artist, so we stay, stay in the north for a, for a moment. But an exhibition in, in Norway, another person who is um, really uh, deeply connected to, to place and a, 
again, a, a very unusual place. The, um, the land of Iceland is uh, often a place of a lot of scientific research and the population in particular, um, because they have a, a very clear record keeping, it, it's often a, a place that, that studies are conducted. And Hilda Björnadotter, as an Icelandic woman herself, pushes back that uh, about back against that a little bit, and is interested in this slightly false idea of purity or the isolation of Iceland as a as an island. And so these are works um, in silk, not uh, not a material <laughs> indigenous to to Iceland. And they are, the, they are dyed, the colour is coming from natural plant dyes, which she is very attentive to collecting from her local, local landscape. But also artificial, um, artificial paint colours. Um, and the, the test and the game is to, to sort of not necessarily think that this one simple idea of purity, that there is somewhere that's, that's isolated and therefore everything is somehow um, ecologically perf per perfect, or that there aren't enormous questions about um, pollution and, uh, and, and, and how we work with, with an environment, even in a, in a unique landscape such as that. The works are often made very particularly for, for an exhibition space. So these large pieces were first made actually to fit site specifically into, into a gallery and then were um, adhered to, to these, these walls in a, in a second space. Um, and you can Im imagine for anyone who works with textile installation, the decisions that need to be made with these, um, these cloths they're not going to behave, they're not going to be straight on, on every edge. And as I said at the beginning with the Pasita Abad work and that sensitivity to acknowledge the back as equally as the front, very particular decisions are made by Hilda Björnadotter about where we will adhere to 90 degrees and where we will accept that this is the textile in its nature um, and it is going to move and shift um, and that is, that's the, that's the fabric structure that's underpinning that. Um, I think that there would have been a time in the past when this would have been framed or trapped um, or, or somehow considered to be wrong because it, it's imperfect in its square box. And she's really resisting that and saying, when you stitch cloth as, as thin as this, this is what we have. The weaving on the, the white contain the weaving on the right contains the mixture of natural and artificial artificial dyes. We move um, south a tiny a tiny nudge. Um, this is a, a Danish artist now, Vibeka Roland, and these are printed works where the artist has become increasingly interested in creating pattern by removing elements from her own artworks. Um, so she went through a, a phase of, of working with, with found and other materials and then realized that maybe what was most interesting was to go back to some of her own textile designs um, and then make them also into artistic pieces by seeing what happened when the, when the colour was removed. She works with a small silk screen and a sque squeegee. She um, plans very little in advance, as, as she says, she works incredibly intuitively. And she refers to the, the idea that this is, an, is intended as an homage to the original work. So this is not about a destructive process. Um, but this is about looking again at existing material and finding new, new ways of, of thinking about it. Um, ironically, she also <laughs> found that in, in some cases, um, some of the textiles were well enough made that they didn't give themselves up very, very easily. She doesn't put chalk um, in the discharge paste to provide herself with a record of what she's doing. So it really is um, later in the process that she actually even gets 
a, a vision of of what the what the work is. So so quite a quite a risky and again a, a high high chance way of working. Not not a, a great great control over planning in advance, but working working much more from intuition. So if those were a hybrid designer artist who takes some of her, her design commissions and also reworks them as one-off art pieces through uh, removal and, and taking, taking out um, in, a, in a way that is, is very aesthetic. Um, here we have a completely different story of, of removal. Some of you might, might be familiar with um, Lauren Schwerd. Um, she's based in New Orleans, or she was based in New Orleans when she was working on, on this project. Um, small scale sculptures that were um, based on photographs that she had taken after Hurricane Katrina of properties that were, that were damaged in the storm, woven, woven and braided and plaited and assembled with human and artificial hair that she found discarded um, again after the after the storm da damage on the on the curb. Um, this is a, um, a, a very different type of removal because Schwerd talks about the fact that the first reaction could be that the businesses and the homes whose contents were removed and put out on the curb that could have been understood as a um, a resignation to the the situation and because of the high humidity in new orleans it was exactly the opposite it was the crucial first step in starting to get things to dry out with every intention to to return um, i think probably this audience is very familiar with the stories about the problems that um, were faced by so many of the people who who intended to to return both to their homes and to their businesses. But an interesting lesson for this work, when I interviewed Schwerd recently for some writing I've done on the, on this project in particular, is that she originally exhibited these artworks with the full um, street address. Of the of the photograph where she had, had taken taken the image, if I jump back, you can sort of see the lamp post and of course the uh, uh, s sign that looks also quite like a cross, um, but is the um, electric electric pole. And she pinpointed them e exactly. Um, that was that was how she named the the artwork. And the photographs and the artwork, uh, the, sorry, the photographs and the, the sculptures were initially displayed together. And she explained to me a, a little bit of a frustration that that then became, on the one hand, a little bit of a uh, exercise in simply mapping her accuracy. Um, but secondly, what she came to realize was that for all of those families that were displaced, and were trying to find information about their insurance claims and if the utilities were being switched on and when they might be able to return. When they used the internet and searched their home address, actually what started to come up were her artworks. Um, and it transpired that the, the recovery or the return was utterly impossible for, for some people and massively, massively delayed for others. I said at the beginning that I'm increasingly interested in how the textile witnesses and, and what, what that function, how that function works. And I've found this to be a really haunting story in our ideas about accuracy and witnessing and respect. Um, because what she's done more recently is, is reduced the titling so it doesn't have the full, full address. 
but we all know how sticky the internet is and that its legacies are very, very difficult to, um, to erase or remove. But she speaks very honestly about this idea that the last thing that she actually wanted was people who were trying to find information about their own homes in internet searches, on, only finding images of her artwork. Of course, she's not entirely to blame for that problem. Uh, it was everything else around that, that crisis that meant they were not finding other types of information. Um, but, but how we witness with, with respect, I think, is, uh, is a very, very challenging topic, um, particularly when the textile is present in so much. What its responsibilities are, I think, is probably going to be a, an increasing point, point of debate. That's the source photograph for what I just showed you. And this arguably is an, another, another example of, of witnessing in a very, very different context again. So now we are in South Africa and Igshan Adams is a young artist, a Cape Malay artist who um, grew, grew up at the very end of, of apartheid and makes work that reflects on that uh, piece of history and that legacy, and also his identity um, as an openly gay man in a relatively conservative culture, um, and working with craft materials in a country that um, quite overtly uh, controlled craft education as, as something that was not accessible to all groups of people, but actually was a way of suppression rather than expression. Um, these are um, also woven pieces using a, a type of uh, recycled nylon, um, which he refers to as being a memory from the a washing line in his um, grandparents' garden. He was raised by his, by his grandparents. Um, some of them, uh, a work like this it is, is tapestry woven around a, around a, a large um, uh, uh, wooden drum, the same thing that would, would hold sort of uh, industrial wire. And the colours uh, are also somewhat outside of Igshan's control. So he purposefully requests um, the nylon fibre that has been recycled and is re-spun together. But you can imagine that that means that the outside of the cone isn't necessarily any type of accurate representation of how the colour might be on the, on the inside. Something that he has accepted and, and works with. But like Lauren Schwerd, I'm, I'm interested in these works of collapse. Um, we spend so much time caring for textiles and repairing textiles. I said even, I think that Hilda Bjornadotter's um, not entirely uh, 90 degrees straight on all sides installation in, in Norway is an acceptance of, of this constant battle with the textile. Um, that it is something that's very flexible. It is um, in this very political work also something that is representing a type of a type of collapse, maybe in a similar way to the Zimbabwean artist Anthony Bumhira. This is more recent um, work by, by Adams. He started to look at linoleum flooring, um, both in the homes of people in his own community um, and in neighbouring communities that would have been separated by apartheid. And of course, what, um, what he is interested in representing is that that separation that apartheid caused didn't make people different, didn't make the homes and the wear and tear any different. It tried to separate humans from, from each other. What these first works um, do is bring them back together, bring those sites that were separated through apartheid's boundaries back 
back together. Literally, you see here the, the linoleum. He's very careful about the fact that he explains that he didn't just take the linoleum. He, he offered to then um, replace it with, with a new flooring so that he could make these giant collages, which then, and maybe you can see this in the deep back of the image, also become the pattern reference for, for further weavings. And so these are um, woven examples, as I've said, of, of including the, the, the staining and all of the wear and tear that the, that the flooring provided, um, bringing together um, interior homes and conversations with people that maybe hadn't, hadn't been together. But then he has admitted more recently to a bit of a revelation and a, and a shift in his thinking. So like so many, he uh, admits that he believed that apartheid's agenda to separate was relatively successful. And this um, recent work is a very large piece on the floor, as you can see with the linoleum reference weavings on the wall. But it is a uh, reflection of desire lines and desire lines are the pathways that um, urban planners didn't intend for. Um, they are the routes that people take, um, even if that's not where the pavement or the sidewalk is or, or where the crossing should, should be, either cutting across uh, uh, grass or um, some, some other surface where you can see that new paths and routes um, are, are being, being made. And so he has more recently had to reflect on the, the fact that, that that separation he was trying to bring back together with the flooring, he then realized from aerial, aerial images that um, some of the separated communities that would have been separated very intentionally um, in Cape Town by something like a highway had all of these desire lines that you could see. He admits now that those journeys don't necessarily always have to have been for good. Um, they could have you know, also been contact with people for violence or for drugs trade, or it's not necessarily that it was always about the positive. But what he's done here in, in this installation is the floor of the Hayward Gallery, where you would stand as a visitor. You are walking literally on a one-to-one -one scale at the desire line between two separated apartheid um, communities. Um, it's called Kicking the Dust um, about a... Um, a, a dance um, and that's that's what the sculptural elements are hanging in the in the sky as well still made from the same same type of type of technique but this time absolutely in the center of london offering somebody the the perspective of what it would be like to stand and try and make make that journey witness what that path or that route might have been there's maybe a, a slightly better sense of scale. I said I would cast, try and cast my net wide, but I, I didn't want to be un, unfair. I think that, that Igshan Adams' ability to try and ask us to stand in that place in, in Cape Town also is a, um, an interesting reminder of the, uh, the vastness through which the textile can operate, but not as vast as, as Anne Wilson's recent work. Um, so these are, these are two absolutely uh, beautiful, beautiful pieces, but shifting back, back and forth um, between the enormity of, of, uh, of the sky, um, a night, night sky and the, the constellations in the sky, and all the way down to uh, an ink drop that, that she has then embroidered on, on top of. Um, I think a really uh, astute representation of just the incredible bandwidth that a textile can capture um, from such minutia. And I must confess, I suppose I have shown you very little minutia today. I've been a bit big, I, 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 I do recognize that. But uh, that ability to toggle between the two, I, I think is, is something that, um, deserves a little bit bit more more recognition, and I think it is certainly apparent in the in the exhibition um, that that we juried. And I'm I'm back at the the beginning now. In in case in case you were you were wondering, 
nearly nearly at the end. This was the image that I that I opened with another um, Danish artist, Anne Fabricus Müller. And this is a work that is uh, about time and it's about patience. Um, she speaks about realizing that we think of a faded textile as something that is a flaw, is wrong. So if curtains fade in a certain way or, or have some damage to them, maybe that's something we should replace or we should over dye or, or control in a certain, certain way. And she started to use fading, this really inescapable function of, um, of textiles as something that was entirely intentional. Um, so these, this is an ongoing series of, of works. Um, they're, they're referred to as faded, um, faded in my window, my the artist's window, or sometimes she lends them out, out to other, other people. And the idea is that um, a collector might choose to uh, acquire this work and open it at some point far, far in the future. And far, far in the future might depend on whether you live um, in Michigan or whether you live in Florida, um, because the fading, of course, will, will depend on where, where things are. She speaks herself about putting them up on her, her balcony and forgetting about them, lending them to friends who use them as a, as a screen against the um, light on a computer screen, a little bit of a blocker, um, but to intentionally expose them to light over time. Um, and one day when you want to open them, they will, they will be patterned, um, of course, in a, in a way that you won't know until you open them, um, in a way that somebody is, is meant to live with them for five or 10 or 15 years. She jokes about preparing an exhibition for work like this is a type of madness. <laughs> you know, she would need 20 years if she started today to have these things, things ready. But I leave you with this idea as an image of patience um, and another type of witnessing. So I have spoken quite a lot about political witnessing. I think it's crucial at the moment, always has been crucial, but is crucial not to step away from now. But this is also witnessing. This is witnessing what cloth wants to do. And I think in a very beautiful way, turning upside down this idea of something that we might see as a negative or a problem, and instead actually embedding it in the, the whole point and the purpose of, of, the, of the work. Um, and as I said, the, the patience and the speculation that if you live with this for some time, you have to make your own decision about when you might open it and choose, choose to see what it has become um, or not. Maybe it becomes a, a legacy into, into the future. So I leave you with, with those, those thoughts, hopefully some, some variety for your, for your conversations for, for the rest, rest of the weekend and thank you.